Welcome to Chapter 18, Part 1, The Industrial Society. And as we already know, prior to the Civil War, there was an industrial revolution in terms of production. As the economy has changed hands from kind of a hand and home production system to one of machines and factories, which had increased the production capacity immensely. But we see the Industrial Revolution continue until the late 1800s, and it was of great importance to the economic development of the United States. Now, the causes of this industrialization, we already talked about some of them, you know, one being the steam revolution, uh, whether it be working uh, in factories with steam-powered mills and textile machinery rather than relying upon rivers and dams, uh, to also using steam and railroads and steamboats and transportation. But railroads were essential to the economic growth in America, as we previously saw by the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, we now connected raw material to the industrial cities, finished products to markets around the United States, and people to wherever their destination may have led them. In fact, by 1880, more than $4.5 billion was spent on building these railroads, and over 131 million acres of land was given from the federal government to the railroad companies as payments, and another 49 million acres from state governments. And so with all you know, this huge amounts of money and land changing hands came some corruption, something that you'll read about a little bit in your books. But not only do we see uh, you know, more and more railroad tracks being laid, but we also see the creation of time zones to try to help coordinate the travel and the businesses. As these different companies used to set their own times, um, nothing was unified. Uh, but eventually, uh, we create four time zones that eventually Congress adopts, uh, which become the Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific time zones that we have today. However, the new industrial growth was kind of based upon several inventions, technologies, and resources. And one of the most important ones was the, uh, the Bessemer process, uh, created by Henry Bessemer in the 1850s in England, while at the same time William Kelly was working to perfect it in the United States. And basically what this did was it took iron ore, and what they found out was that if you pump in some air while it's being heated, and all the impurities melted out, that what you have left is steel. And the steel was stronger, it lasted longer, it was easier to work with, and it really becomes the kind of basic building block in the modern industrial city and world. For it's that steel that's going to build railroads and bridges and buildings, buildings that can be built you know, uh, high up in the sky in skyscrapers, rather than just limit themselves to, you know, maybe three or four stories before. But there were many inventors and inventions that really spurred on this economic growth and development. And probably one of the most famous inventors of all time was the Wizard of Menlo Park, Thomas Edison. Um, at working out of his laboratory in New Jersey, eventually he's going to develop over a thousand patents, including things like the motion picture camera, the dictaphone, uh, the phonograph, but probably most important is his perfection of the incandescent light bulb. It took him over 16,000 attempts to find a filament that would eventually work, and it burned brighter and lasted longer, changing the world forever. With the flick of a switch, he was able to do away with darkness. And once he created this light bulb, um, in 1880, uh, he started to develop uh, you know, ways to produce electricity and work uh, extensively on bringing power to many different cities around the nation. And eventually, the company becomes General Electric, or GE, uh, and with the financial support of J.P. Morgan, uh, he's able to build different power stations around the United States to help light up the nighttime skies. Another inventor that's going to kind of change life forever is, is Alexander Graham Bell. Now, even though his invention of the telephone maybe didn't have as quite a big of an impact back then because people thought, well, we have telegraph, 
why do we need a telephone? Uh, but he develops this in 1876, and it quickly takes off. And by 1895, there's well over 310,000 telephones around the nation. And eventually, um, in 1885, he had created AT&T, or the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. Now, whereas Edison had worked with electricity in what we know as a direct current, DC, George Westinghouse worked to improve that and created alternate current, AC. Um, alternate current was easier. Uh, it was a safer way of providing electricity to businesses and homes around the nation. And it could travel um, further distances. So it was definitely an improvement upon Edison's direct current. And that's why sometimes on your you know, radios or you know, things that you might plug in, you know, there's a little switch that, you know, AC, DC. You know, there's a difference between using a battery, uh, direct current, or plugging it into the wall for an alternate current. And so we see the United States really becomes a, kind of a nation of tinkerers and inventors. Um, in fact, uh, if our U.S. population today is roughly 330 million people, it's about 4.5% of the world's population. But according to the Conference Board of Canada, the United States has created more than 30% of all patents. And then also according to the U.S. Patent Office, there's about 1 million patents that they issue in the United States each decade. So you can see we continue to be kind of these um, cutting-edge uh, tinkers, inventors, and that kind of helps to continue to spur on economic growth and development, which you can see is also true here back in the late teen hundreds. But if we take a quick look at some other causes of industrialization as well, we see one is our abundant labor pool. As millions of immigrants from around the world came seeking a better life, um, they were able to try to find jobs in these new industries. In fact, from 1870 to 1916, over 25 million new immigrants came to the U.S. You can see we also had an abundant natural resources, whether it be iron ore, oil, or whatever it might be. Uh, but we also had capital. Uh, with the success of businesses came people looking to share in the profits. And so they bought stocks and bonds of the companies which provided that capital that companies needed to continue to expand. We also had government support. Um, some of these things we looked at in the past, you know, maybe it was uh, in the form of protective tariffs, subsidies, or whatever, um, to try to promote this economic growth. But we also had entrepreneurs, good businessmen, uh, that knew how to run an efficient business, and something that we'll take a closer look at in future lessons. And if you couple all these factors uh, with the creation of a national market, uh, you have this economic boom and prosperity that we saw, um, our Industrial Revolution. Right? And with these uh, kind of chain stores that developed like Macy's, Sears, Roebuck, uh, Montgomery Wards, um, all these created ways to try to get the new products to, to the consumers, including the use of mail order catalogs. People could now order something from a catalog and have it delivered with the aid of, you know, railroads and, you know, telegraphs and telephones and stuff like that. Um, but uh, with this uh, creation of this national market uh, came advertising. And it really created um, truly one national market where anyone, anywhere could really buy anything. Um, and it kind of created that national demand. Um, it didn't matter now if you lived out west or down south. Um, you, could, you could purchase the goods much more easier and quicker than ever before. But we'll take, uh, you know, continue our look at the Industrial Revolution in our next episode.